for being here today. This is one of our series of events uh, surrounding the For All the People exhibit from the National Library of Medicine. So that's For All the People, a Century of Citizen Action and Healthcare Reform. Um, and next week is our last week of the exhibit. So if you haven't seen it, it's not big, but it's cool. So hop on over to the Health Science Center Library and take a look. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Dan Morales with us today. He's an assistant professor at Florida International University. Um, he's a historian of the United States, African American life and culture, public health, sexuality, social movements, and the human body. Uh, his current book project, To Make the Wounded Whole, African American Responses to HIV AIDS, examines grassroots response to, responses to just to the disproportionate impact of HIV and AIDS on black communities. And so that's a, a piece of that is what he'll be talking to us about with us about today. Sorry, losing all my presentations. <laughs> um, so um, this talk is sponsored by the Health Science Center Libraries and the National Library of Medicine, so we thank them as well. And uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Lowe. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to talk at this level so that that stays the case. Um, but thanks to Hannah and everybody at the Health Health Science Health, health Sciences Science Center Library. Okay, yeah. I was trying to like get it in my brain when you were, when you were talking, and then it went out. But thanks everybody for um, for welcoming me and for being here and uh, for having me back. Um, it's great to be back here talking again about um, some of my work in a different kind of stage in the process. I was here two years, two and a half years ago. Uh, to talk at the public library about the exhibition, another National Library of Medicine exhibition um, called Surviving and Thriving on the History of HIV and AIDS. And so I'm happy to be back for another, for another National Library of Medicine exhibit to talk about um, another piece of my work. And so as Hannah said, the part of the work that I'm talking about today is a chapter in my book manuscript. And it's actually the, the piece of the book that I have been working on the most recently, so it's like the chapter that I that is the freshest in my mind, it's the freshest on paper, um, and so I'm happy to have the opportunity to come and talk with you all um, about it and, and think through some of the things that I'm arguing in, in that chapter. So as Hannah said, the book is titled To Make the Wounded Whole, African American Responses to HIV and AIDS, and in it I describe the ways that black communities have responded to the AIDS crisis. And when I began this project, about 10 years ago, and it was my dissertation in graduate school, um, very little had been written from an academic or even from a popular uh, standpoint about, about black responses to AIDS, even though we've known for a long time, almost as long as the epidemic has been going on, or as long as the epidemic has been recognized, that black communities suffer under the like, vastly disproportionate impact of HIV and AIDS. And so I'll say like today, Thankfully, that kind of hole in our understanding is being filled um, by other scholars as well. Like, there are people working on kind of all dimensions of black responses um, and black experiences in the AIDS crisis. So, um, I'm happy for that, and, you know, I'm happy to contribute to that as well. But when I started this project 10 years ago, the work that had kind of been done up to that point tended to argue that African Americans did not respond forcefully to AIDS in their communities. And the reason that literature kind of had that bent to it is because people tended to look at either national organizations, groups like the NAACP or the National Urban League, um, and miss these kind of grassroots or more grassroots stories of black AIDS activism, which are often scattered across you know, many different archives or require oral history or require digital, digital archeology, span kind of different methods to uncover. And so a lot of the research that I'll be presenting today um, comes from uh, Smith University, no, Smith College, not university, Smith College Library um, and the Sophia Smith uh, Women's History Collection up there where the, the founder of this organization, Sister Love, has uh, donated her papers, but drew from some other collections that I had been researching um, in Atlanta and elsewhere. So the, the, the book as a whole challenges this idea of black passivity or black powerlessness in the face of HIV and AIDS that has really characterized a lot of the ways that we look at the, the epidemic both from a scholarly standpoint and a lot of the popular narratives that surround the epidemic as well. And what I'm trying to show with the book is that there's a thing called African-American AIDS activism, and it's actually been this really diverse and creative 
project. And I think that um, this piece of that research really speaks to uh, that as well. So what I argue in the book is that over the course of the ap epidemic, African-American AIDS activists have renegotiated the meanings of black identity and black community um, in two key ways. And the first is through a kind of uh, renegotiation or making room for the place, making room for queer sexuality within prevailing ideas about U.S. blackness, uh, and then rethinking the relationship between African Americans and the rest of the African diaspora. And we'll see how both of these things come through in the sister love story. So that story that I'm going to tell today is the story of sister love, which is, oh, that was wrong. Sister love. There we go. It's a story of sister love, an Atlanta-based organization that takes an explicitly intersectional approach to AIDS prevention and AIDS education among black women with a focus on uh, women in Georgia, particularly in the rural, uh, not rural, natural Atlanta area, um, and then in South Africa. And so I'll talk about kind of how that expansion uh, came to be and how that uh, plays on uh, sister, love, sister love's overall mission. And the story of Mr. Love founder, uh, Jason Dixon Diallo. And the story is really important because, on one hand, the, the, the disproportionate impact of HIV and AIDS on black communities becomes really especially clear when we look at the epidemic among black women. And on the other hand, the U.S. South has been the front line of the U.S. AIDS epidemic for, for decades, really, for, for some time. Um, these are all numbers from 2017. Um, but you can see, like, the southern, the, the deep south is, uh, you know, the kind of most consistently, the consistently the darkest part of the map where the rates of HIV diagnosis are highest. And, you know, we have some of the, the cities that have the highest rates of new HIV infections in the country. They're like Baton Rouge, it's Miami, it's Orlando, it's Jacksonville, it's Atlanta. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of the major cities in, in the deep south. Uh, and so what this story shows us is, or helps us to understand, is the, the factors behind that. Why black women in the United States and then, and then elsewhere are so vulnerable to HIV. And then also helps us to understand what black women have done in response to the epidemic, because that is an important, really important piece of the story as well. So before I get into that, I want to kind of outline how the story that I'm going to tell fits into those two, two avenues of the argument uh, of, the, of the overall book, um, making room for queer sexuality and then rethinking the relationship between black America and the rest of the, the African diaspora. Um, so in the context of this story, um, I'm using the word queer in kind of a, a more expansive way than I do in the rest of the book. Because in a lot of the rest of the book, it is about making room for black gay men, black gay and bisexual men, black men who have sex with men, um, within prevailing ideas about U.S. blackness. So um, making room for same-sex desire within uh, black cultural nationalism or within Kwanzaa principles, uh, you know, in those kinds of ways. How I use it in this chapter is a little bit different, and I'm drawing on uh, the work of Kathy Cohen, um, who is actually one of those authors who has written about uh, is, is in, in Black America previously, um, but the, sense, the, the definition of queer that she outlines in her essay, uh, Punks, Bull Daggers, and Welfare Queens, um, which calls for a kind of progressive politics around these non-normative um, or marginal sexual identities and practices. So the title is Punks, which is an a African-American slang for effeminate men, Bull Daggers, which is African American slang for mannish, lesbian, bush women, um, and then Welfare Queens, which is neither of those, but is still, especially in the in the time that she's writing in the 90s, um, you know, is the focus of surveillance, is the focus of a lot of discussion about uh, queer sexuality in the sense of being surveilled and policed and stigmatized. And what she's saying is like, you know, these, there, there's a potential for us to draw connections among these, these three kinds of identities, these gender non-binary or, you know, gender non-conforming identities with these other sexually stigmatized groups to 
to to push forward uh, a, a different kind of progressive queer politics. Um, and so I'm using it in that sense because Sister Love, in their work on AIDS in black communities, or in AIDS in black women, and in their outreach, um, focuses on lots of different kinds of women. They focus on rural women, they focus on recently incarcerated women, they focus on women in public housing, um, who in, in different ways fit into this kind of queer understanding of sexuality especially as it pertains to their risk or their vulnerability for HIV. And so starting from the principle that AIDS programs for black women needed to address these interlocking oppressions. So this is like the intersectional piece of their work, right? The programs for black women need to address the intersection of oppressions like racism and sexism, but also um, in their work, they consider the ways that class enters into this uh, equation that region, that nation uh, inform their work as well. So we'll see like the ways that they're thinking intersectionally about the many different dimensions of their work, especially as they move into uh, the global south, um, particularly into South Africa. So that's kind of one piece of the argument, like queer sexuality piece of the argument. The other piece of the argument is about diaspora. And so what this story also shows us is the way that African American AIDS activists were thinking about the similarities between the U.S. South they're working in, in Georgia and metro Atlanta. Um, and then the global south, what we sometimes call the developing world, or we, you know, the, the third, wor third world is kind of passing into, uh, you know, disuse now. Um, but thinking about the connections uh, or the similarities between the U.S. south and the global south as they're working to forge very concrete connections uh, among women in those two places. And so that's where the, the idea of Sister Love being in the South within the North comes in. And I took this phrase from a single source from this one guidebook uh, for transnational NGO partnerships that they wrote in 2003 um, because it encapsulates or it captures a lot of what I think about is, think is interesting about their approach to AIDS activism among women of African descent, um, you know, in the U.S. and then beyond. Because this phrase calls our attention to the similarities between the U.S. South, and the global South, while recognizing that those two places are not the same, right? It's the U.S. geographic South within the global North, um, and in this context, uh, African-American AIDS activism uh, captures a sense of connection. This, this connection is often expressed as drawing on a common culture or on a shared set of challenges, so kind of, um, you know, broadly around race or around global race or around global class. Um, and this certainly has been the case with the way that Sister Love talks about their work. At the same time, as we'll see, they're really careful to think about how other things like region and nation intersect with gender and race in shaping the epidemic among a black women in metro Atlanta, but then how it makes the, that epidemic or the approach to that epidemic necessarily different from the work that they do with black women in, say, Johannesburg or the area around Johannesburg as they move into rural South Africa. In that comparison, that understanding of the AIDS epidemic in black America and particularly among black women as being connected to the epidemic in Africa is really important. Um, and I want to distinguish between what I think is important about it and the way that this often gets talked about, again, in, in popular media, um, in the news, in the press. Um, and that is often this is how I have to say that, like, Metro Atlanta or the AIDS epidemic Atlanta is as bad as in Harare or in Durban. It's just kind of like, it, it, it's meant to, you know, kind of shock people into awareness, right? I mean, there's a rhetorical goal here, and it's not one that's, like, necessarily bad, or, you know, it's not one that is bad. Like, it's, it's, the aim is to raise awareness about the severity of the epidemic at home, which we don't pay enough attention to. Um, but it's a kind of, I think it's a kind of surface-level surface level analysis, right? It's talking about the outcome rather than the set of factors that underlies the outcome. Because the South is the epicenter of the U.S. AIDS epidemic, and again, it has been for some time. And that is, in, our, in large part, uh, thanks to a politics of neglect and of underdevelopment that is fueled by anti-blackness, full stop. And that is the case with AIDS in Africa, I would argue, as well. And so that's what I think is really important, is that 
Sister of Love's work draws our attention to both of those things and draws our connection or draws our attention to the connection uh, between those two things. At the same time, the Sister of Love story connects its activism in concrete ways to the project of black feminism. Uh, and this is a, a kind of key piece of the chapter. Um, to the project of black feminism, um, because Sister Love has kind of put their work around AIDS within the larger project of advancing black women's sexual and reproductive well-being. So this kind of holistic understanding of black women's health, putting AIDS and HIV um, within that. And so this story connects really specifically to the black women's health movement, and particularly to the work of Billy Avery and the Black Women's Health Project. So I began working on this chapter and began writing this chapter before I knew that I was going to come here and talk about it, but there's a great Gainesville connection here. Um, because before she started the Black Women's Health Project in the 1980s, uh, Billy Avery helped to found the Gainesville Women's Health Center in 1974, um, which was, you know, one of the uh, women's health centers that was part of the women's health movement in the 1970s. So this is from the, the, the exhibition, um, what is it called? <laughs> for All the People. Um, so this is from the, the For All the People exhibition. Uh, the Boston Women's Health Collective, um, their, the, the book for their course on women and their bodies. Um, it kind of brings together that, that, that history uh, with the history of black women's grassroots activism. So it's like this story intersected with this story or stories like this of the National Welfare Rights Organization, which fought for the right of um, the rights and dignity of poor women, so like fighting for the rights, fighting for women's health rights, fighting for the rights and dignity of poor women. Um, you know, these two stories kind of come together in the Black Women's Health Project story, Black Women's Health Project story, and then that story kind of leads into the Sister Love story. And Sister Love is really, you know, kind of of a piece with both of those movements. Um, and so the kind of milieu that Sister Love comes out of is this moment in the 1970s and in the early 1980s that are really important for women of color or what, is, what was then called third world, again, kind of like playing with, with the region or the, the, the location or the place um, of where people kind of cite their identities. Um, these are really important years for women of color third world feminism. So in, in, 19, in 1977, the Combahee River Collective, uh, pictured here, um, issued their influential manifesto on, quote, black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. So Combahee is this early articulation of what we today refer to as intersectionality or intersectional thinking that, um, you know, that specific term is not coined until somewhat later, but we get the, like, intellectual ferment of that earlier in the 1970s uh, with Combahee. And so this would be followed by, um, by books like Homegirl, the Black Feminist Anthology, uh, edited by Barbara Smith, who is pictured here. She was a member of Combahee, um, and this bridge called My Back, writings by radical women of color. Um, Homegirl is about the many dimensions of black women's experience, including their sexual experience. And then this bridge called My Back is um, kind of a collection of essays and poems and stories uh, that gives voice to Latina and Asian American and Native American women authors, along with African American women authors. Both of these books were published by Kitchen, of, Kitchen Table Women of Color Press, which was started by Barbara Smith and Audre Lorde in 1981, uh, and then Lorde herself. Uh, Audre Lorde was one of the lights of black feminism, and her many influential essays include uh, Uses of the Erotic, which, in which she examined women's erotic potential as both an instrument of their oppression and the key to their liberation. So this is one of the like key intellectual streams that is feeding into Sister Love's work um, through groups like the Black Women's Health Project. And so that story of Sister Love starts um, about a decade after um, this wave of third world feminism starts um, in the early 1980s when Dezon Dixon Diallo, who's the founder of Sister Love, was a student at Spelman College in Atlanta. And so it was there in, in June 1983, the National Women's Health Network, which is part of this you know, kind of larger set of black women's health organizations, hosted the first conference in the United States on the health status of women.
women of color. And that conference is important in the larger story of the Black Women's Health Movement because it was there that Billy Avery, uh, former Gainesville resident, uh, founded the Black Women's Health Project. And so Dixon Diallo remembers this conference as being foundational to her work in women's health. And it's also important because it's at this conference that the idea of the, the kind of uh, the Black Women's Health Project framework of self-help as a means of improving the health of black women took shape. And this idea of self-help um, in this particular context with this particular meaning would be really important for the ways that Sister Love approached AIDS prevention among black women, first in Georgia and then later on in South Africa. And the idea of self-help in this context um, has a particular meaning that's somewhat different from its meaning in the uh, you know, larger sphere of women's health activism. Um, in this formulation, it's that black women would not be healthy until they grappled with internalized racism and internalized sexism, the things that kind of made them feel physically and spiritually and emotionally unwell. So again, this kind of holistic understanding of health. And so this is somewhat different from the idea of self-help that Avery had used at the Gainesville Women's Health Center in the um, you know, kind of uh, broader sense in women's health activism, where self-help means uh, women coming to understand their bodies through the practice of cervical self-exam. Like, that is what self-help means in the feminist women's uh, health movement context. In the Black Women's Health Project context, it means something a little bit different, and that that slightly different meaning is the one that Sister Love would take forward. So, using this idea of self-help, groups like Sister Love um, would create spaces for black women to share and process their experiences while also providing them with important health information. And so this holistic framework gave activists like Dixon Diallo a way to connect black women's lived experience of social and structural determinants of health to their vulnerability to HIV. So it's a kind of key intellectual piece for how Dixon Diallo will come to understand um, AIDS among black women and then try to address it. Um, and this is one example of how the idea of Sister Love being in the South within the North comes into play because not only are they in the literal U.S. South, but <laughs> this idea that the particular conditions of black women's lives sets them apart from both black men and from women of other races in terms of the exposure to HIV. So the sense of black women kind of being in a place apart from, you know, the people even geographically or, you know, spatially um, around them in terms of their vulnerability to HIV. So in some ways, the Sister Loves AIDS Prevention programs that follow from the self-help model don't look altogether different from those that we see in other uh, contexts. Um, their core HIV intervention was and is uh, this program called Healthy Love, and it's a safe sex party designed to educate black women about safe sex and HIV and to teach them how to negotiate safer sex with their partners. So this is, like, not a particularly unique intervention in, the, like, the larger world of HIV intervention. The safe sex party is, like, kind of a thing yes. in, in its prevention. So we have others. Um, this is another one that I've written about, um, <coughs> Hot, Horny, and Healthy, uh, which is initially a safe sex workshop designed by Michael Chernoff and Luis Palacio Jimenez, um, and then is adapted for Black Gay Men, which is the one that's advertised here, by Phil Wilson in the late 1980s. And the goal, again, is showing participants um, that safe sex can be fun, that it can be erotic, um, and giving them the kind of tools to negotiate that with their partners so that they can protect themselves from HIV. Um, but healthy love takes on a particular significance in the context of this self-help approach. So in, in running these parties, facilitators were supposed to like create a comfortable atmosphere in which the women could share personal experiences around sex, to have them sit in a circle, to signal that everybody's kind of on equal ground. Um, and these are important kind of elements in bringing self-help to AIDS prevention and education. Um, Validating black women's sexual desire was also a really important piece of that process. And so the workshop did this by having women do different things, like give themselves sexy names, uh, write out their sexual fantasies, talk about synonyms for, uh, you know, for genitalia and for sex acts and for different, you know, uh, words associated with human sexuality. Um, and one part of the workshop, which uh, Devon has told me it's her favorite part of the workshop, um, 
called the, the box of safe erotic potential. So it's like a box of household items, suggestions include a turkey baster, a feather duster, a jar of honey, and binoculars. Um, and then participants like pick from the box and then tell how they would use the item like safely and erotically with a partner. And I mean, this is really important, I think, because given the way that black women's sexuality has historically been pathologized in American culture, creating this space for black women to understand themselves as sexually autonomous and empowered um, for sister love, for this and yellow is like a really important uh, part of undoing that internalized oppression that self-help in the black women's health project sense aims to undo. So kind of going forward as the epidemic continued, um, Dix and Diallo became really concerned about the impact of HIV among poor women and among, uh, among poor black women and among rural black women. And she knew firsthand that, that these were problems. Um, one, through her work as a counselor at Brady Hospital's infectious disease, infectious disease Clinic for Women, and then through women in her hometown, uh, Fort Valley, Georgia, a community of 8,000 outside of Atlanta, is home to the historically black Fort Valley State College. And so she got the idea to kind of tackle both of these things, uh, to tackle HIV among both of these groups at once. So with founding from the American Foundation for AIDS Research, she trained women at the Center for Black Women's Wellness, which was a program of the National Black Women's Health Project uh, that was housed in McDaniel Glen Community, which is one of Atlanta's public housing projects. So doing kind of training women in housing projects to facilitate their own uh, healthy love parties, and then doing the same thing with the Fort Valley College chapter of uh, the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. So this program called Women United for Women at Risk, or WUAR, uh, was built on the idea that people in affected communities, uh, training them to be peer educators could make a really uh, significant impact on the course of the epidemic. Um, and in doing this work, uh, doing HIV education with these women, um, Sister Love found that they were starving, they were, quote, starving for this kind of support and attention. Um, but AIDS prevention and AIDS care was only one way in which these women had been ignored or overlooked, and Sister Love found that this was just one of their problems. Um, some of the women lacked the ability to read and write, which made it really difficult to evaluate the program through normal methods like a written survey. Um, but many women also struggle to find stable housing, or they were raising children on their own, or had, they have been caught up in the system of mass incarceration. And HIV made all of these problems worse. Uh, HIV made all of these problems worse, and vice versa, all these problems made HIV worse. Um, women who tested positive for HIV or who developed AIDS were often shunned by their families, and homelessness made it, made it difficult for HIV-positive women to take care of their health. So Sister Love had to come up with a way to address this cluster of issues that black women in and around Atlanta were facing. And again, these approaches were born out of the ethic of black feminist self-help, with its focus on giving women the space to speak and be heard. So Dixon Diallo recalls this from an oral history that they did at Sophia Smith. Um, that she would just go to the infectious disease clinic at Grady Hospital on Fridays when they had the women's clinic. And she calls it, she would just sit in the waiting room. Uh, I would turn off the TV, Phil Donahue was, on, was still on back then, and start talking to women about what was going on with them. Other than health needs, what did they need? And I thought this, this kind of piece of the oral history was interesting because it's her recollection of talking to women at the clinic um, but it distills the kind of feminist, black feminist foundations of Sister Love's work into this, like, one scene. So she's, like, going into the, ho going into the hospital, um, historically a space of um, both white male authority and black women's trauma. Um, if we think about the, the history of medical experimentation and exploitation, um, if you're familiar with um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, Rebecca Kluth's book, um, you know, this is a... a, a that's one episode in a much longer history. Um, so going into the space of, of white male authority and black women's trauma, um, she's inviting black women to talk about their experiences. Um, and I, I think it's also like kind of droll to note, like she's literally silencing Phil Donahue, a, a white, you know, male, authoritative white male figure. 
um, in order to do so. Um, but she's inviting them to act as experts in their own health and their own care. And I mean, that really grows out of, um, you know, black feminist health activism and, and feminist health activism more broadly. And so she points to that process of listening to women, to black women in the, in the clinic, tell their stories as a point of origin for what would become the first transitional uh, housing program for women with HIV and their children in the South. And that's a program that Sister Love starts in 1992 called Love House. So it starts as like a supporter of the organization, like gave them space in their condo to house four women. And from there, they were able to get funding to buy a set of adjacent properties in a historically black section of Southwest Atlanta um, where they can house and, you know, to this day can house um, 10 single women and five of their children. Um, but again, it becomes clear that their clients need more than just housing, just like they need more than just HIV education or HIV care. Um, so they have to incorporate programs like um, uh, programs around addiction or around recovery from sexual abuse or domestic violence. Um, but in this way, they're trying to, and this is a, from one of their grant applications, to develop the overall quality of women's lives and not just focusing on their HIV status. So that's the kind of work that they're doing in and around Atlanta. At the same time that they're doing that work, Dixon Diallo is looking for ways to take that work overseas, um, particularly into Africa. Um, so in 1991, she submitted a proposal to the International Center for Research on Women to support a, a partnership with the Society for Women Against AIDS in Nigeria. And in this application, uh, she argued that there was a set of common challenges that would ground a partnership between these two groups. Um, in the United States, she wrote, most of the women of color living below the poverty level, and in many cases survive situations similar to women in developing countries around the world. So poverty, powerlessness, stigma, and denial uh, were common to the experiences of women with black women with AIDS on each side of the Atlantic, and she argued that the healthy love uh, intervention would help to empower women to protect themselves against HIV in Atlanta, as well as in Lagos. Uh, that project went unfunded, but key elements of this proposal, um, including the partnership between Sister Love and African women, women's AIDS groups, um, the sense of common experience among different women, among, among women in different parts of the African diaspora, and this emphasis on self-help would be key features of Sister Love's later endeavors into Africa as well. Um, so over the next, you know, roughly decade, um, this is when you get the, uh, the UN Conference on Women uh, or the International Conference on Women in Beijing. There's a whole lot of activity going on and a whole lot of conversation going on around the status of women globally. And Dixon Diallo is very much a part of those conversations. They send delegations to, um, to Beijing in 95, forget where the conference was in 1990, in Cairo in 1994, um, but they're very much in and of those conversations. And finally, in 1999, they're able to get funding from CDC and from USAID to develop this thing called the Women's HIV AIDS Resource Project, or WARP. Um, and this is in partnership with a, a cluster of groups in South Africa, uh, the Positive Women's Network, the Society for Women Against AIDS South Africa, and the Township AIDS Project. So again, a focus on women's AIDS groups uh, in South Africa. And the idea of this project was to combine HIV and education about HIV and sexually transmitted infections with discussions about women's human and reproductive rights. And it was one of um, one of several kind of partnerships funded under this uh, linkages program by the CDC. And out of this effort, Sister Love produced this manual for transnational partnerships between <coughs> AIDS groups. And I, this is a, a really rich document. It's quite a long document. Um, but it highlights the influence of black feminism on not just the way that Sister Love approached HIV prevention with African American women, but the way that they thought about their partnerships with organizations in the global south as well. If you do the history of the early 2000s, you will see a lot of comic fans. Um, <laughs> so this manual, uh, which was written by Mbahadi Kumba, who was a, a women's studies professor at uh, Spelman College, which was, of which uh, Dixon Diallo was an alumna, um, and later became actually an adjunct faculty as well. 
this manual emphasized that in transnational partnerships between organizations in the global north and their counterparts in the global south, the agency should, quote, avoid posing a north-to-south bias and place emphasis on the mutual learning and symbiotic relationship of transnational partnerships. So what they're saying here is that like, even a South, a South within the North NGO, and this is the, the, the source of where that phrase comes from, um, even a group like Sister Love needs to think deliberately and intersectionally about how power along a North-South axis would operate in these kinds of transnational partnerships. Um, even as they're saying that there is this common experience of margin, marginalization by race and class and gender that links black women in Georgia to black women in Africa. And perhaps Sister Love is better equipped than almost any age group to take this kind of approach to their work um, across the Atlantic. So Sister Love staffer Stephanie New remarked that this project was about sharing knowledge in a horizontal rather than a vertical manner. You have to be careful when you are a primary grantee that you don't take on the donor mentality of dictating to the subgrantee. You have to be mindful of your assumptions that you may make in terms of what capacities or what capabilities our sisters have in South Africa. So this project, WARP, was followed by um, another project called the, the Tembalelo HIV AIDS Capacity Building Project that was also funded by CDC. And so whereas this project focused on groups in Johannesburg, um, the Tembalelo project moved just east into a province called Mpumalanga that is quite a bit more rural, um, where there's a whole set, a, a whole different set of kind of issues. Um, so, but as they move into Mpumalanga, Sister Love bases their approach on this kind of non-hierarchical um, approach outlined in the manual. So when they went to Mpumalanga, they were very deliberate about hiring South African staff for the South Africa office um, and involving all the local groups in the planning stages of that project. Um, and so one, a member of one of those local organizations um, reported that Sister Love quote, wanted to know from us what the, or what the organization has, what we receive from the other organizations, our needs, how they can strengthen our organization. Not the other way, not the way other people have done before when they come with their things and leave us. So Sister Love really tries deliberately to build um, a lot more reciprocity and a lot more accountability um, to the local communities into the way that they come into uh, in Pumalanga. So Sister Love leaders and staff try to even out that balance of power between themselves and their partners on the ground, but those partners sometimes subverted those efforts uh, in a kind of interesting way um, by making clear that they saw Sister Love as a mentor organization rather than as a kind of horizontal equal player. So um, an, uh, an evaluation of the program by an outside group found that uh, several organizations described Sister Love as the parent, mentor, or leader. On the one hand, this reflects the very positive and supportive role that Sister Love plays in these organizations. However, it also indicates that there's an unequal power relationship between sister love and beneficiaries. This is not the only obstacle that they encounter, the community partners kind of subverting their, uh, their non-hierarchical structure. Um, the, probably the biggest <laughs> obstacle was that CDC pulled funding for the project two years early, in 2004 rather than in 2006, um, although they told sister love that they remained supportive of the project. Um, but that loss of funding shortened their timeline significantly and left them scrambling to make up the difference. Uh, lower <laughs> poverty also proved to be a major challenge because, you know, in a similar way that the women in Metro Atlanta had a large set of needs outside of HIV education, um, the local communities in Mpumalanga needed thing, basic things like food and water and clothing. And these are things that they asked the AIDS organizations for. Um, so, you know, suggesting that for people on the ground, you know, AIDS might be an abstract or a secondary concern if you're, you know, really concerned about your day-to-day -day access to clean water or food or shelter or clothing. Um, so as this capacity building project was coming to an end in 2004, uh, Diallo formed uh, a, a second project uh, called the Tembalelo Trust Cooperative, a 668-acre farm in Mpumalanga that combined AIDS prevention with poverty alleviation. So along with HIV testing and education, 
they raise cows and chickens and vegetables to meet some of their ba- some of the region's basic needs, while selling the surplus as uh, a source of income. And so the goal here is to help women become financially independent from men, so that they're less vulnerable to HIV, and to offer empowerment and dignity to all women, including women who are already living with HIV. And and this is interesting because it brings us back to back around to the connections between South Africa and the Deep South, where collective farming has long been a part of the fight for black freedom. And Dixon Diallo, Dixon Diallo Royal did, forgot an important slide. Um, but so Dixon Diallo has made this connection uh, explicit. Um, in an interview, she says, in the South where we are, we have a lot of the same issues, even if it's, even if it's a different set of economies, right? We have a lot of poverty and violence and lack of access to opportunity that increase women's risk for HIV and AIDS. We need to learn how to do that community development bridge building between service delivery, advocacy, and growing and developing communities so that individuals, families, and whole neighborhoods are able to do what they need to do to solve their own problems. So again, um, bringing the work in South Africa back around to Metro Atlanta um, to highlight the similarities between those two places and the kind of approach that they both call for. Um, so what I think is really interesting about this story is that it gives us a, a, a picture of the kind of generations of activism that inform not only AIDS activism generally, but black AIDS activism specifically. And we see this in Dixon Diallo's connection to Lee Avery and to the Black Women's Health Project, how she herself um, you know, kind of puts her work into this lineage of black women's uh, health activism. Um, And I think that's really interesting, kind of using the intellectual tools of black feminism and particularly of intersectional black feminism to address, you know, what remains, um, you know, a a terribly devastating ongoing um, epidemic. And, but as I've been writing about this work, about sister love, um, and thinking about what some of that, what some of the, the, the intellectual um, production of black feminism, black feminism has been, I think it's really important to point out that all of this happens within these larger contexts. All of this happens within the context of American conservatism, um, of global capitalism, and that those things really constrain what groups like Sister Love can do um, and how effective they can actually be in doing this work. And going back to the kind of genesis of the Black Feminist World Vision in the Combahee River Collective Statement, um, that statement is a really kind of radical, challenging statement um, about the need to overturn political, whole political and economic systems. Um, and those very same systems, those are the very same systems that make Black women more vulnerable to HIV. Um, And so it's kind of squaring the circle of, you know, we're talking about these really important approaches that ultimately are centered on individual empowerment. This is true of this job. This is true of a lot of organizations. And that's important work. Um, But at some point, it it, it comes to seem a little bit like, um, I don't know, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic or like trying to bail out a boat with a teacup. I don't know. There's probably like some really good (laughs) aphorism for that. Um, But it's that tension between programs that focus on individual empowerment in the context of systems that really limit how effective those programs can be. Because you can be as empowered as you want uh, or, you know, as empowered as possible, but if the system in which you are living, the political system, the economic system, um, the structures in which you live, uh, you know, still drive you toward ill health, um, then what are you left with? And that's kind of what I'm left with as I'm trying to wrap up this book. Um, it's like, what, what do you say about that? Because at some point it comes to be like, um, you know, this is, this is in many ways a tragic story, and I think maybe this is one of the elements of that tragedy, is that this work is so constrained um, and so ambitious and important, 
but you know, in some ways, just so doomed. I don't know. <laughs> but I'll end there. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't have a happy ending. No, I really don't. Like, I mean, and like seriously. Uh, yeah. This is the problem with doing present history is you know there's no happy ending. I'm not copying for the French. What? <laughs> Yeah, no, we shouldn't. Yeah. But um, anybody have questions? Yeah. Um, see, I love hearing about uh, such a love, you know, transnational work. And yeah. Super fun and exciting. Um, so obviously, they do have the barriers of like of the the beneficiary organizations in South Africa were kind of like, oh, look, it's you know our mentor and then yeah. here. I like, I, I don't know. I I, I want to think there are also certain like cultural elements to that as well. Yeah. Um,
there's a lot of organi other organizations that are fighting those things too. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I have a lot of questions. Um, so, yeah, speaking of sort of like the sad ending aspect mm -hmm. of a lot of these things, um, so that I just found a lot of similarities. So, like, you're a sad ending, like, I'm teaching on a book about endometriosis, and, like, okay. it doesn't have a happy ending. It ends with, yeah. like, her finding a new set of symptoms and now having to go through this whole struggle to get adequate health care mm -hmm. yet again. So, I guess, um, like, as I'm, like, my students haven't read that part of the book yet, and I'm yeah. like, oh, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to handle their emotional reactions once we get to that. But I guess, yeah, so this is more of a meta question about, like, narrative building and storytelling. When you are dealing with, like, present history and things like that, how do you, how do you, how do you contextualize and kind of, I don't know, yeah, how do you just build that narrative when, when there's, like, things are ongoing, the ending is not happy, it is, like, I don't know, I guess, like, how do you build a narrative out of unhappy endings? Yeah. That, that people are, are not dissatisfied and are just paralyzed with, like, sadness, but are, you know, inspired to act and get involved and to do and to learn? Um, that's your question. Not sure that I know. Um, I mean, uh, when I, I'll say, when I spoke here at last, which was in the summer of 2016, I imagined a very different ending for this book than I imagined today because the ending for the book has changed, you know. Um, I didn't imagine two and a half years ago, that the ending of the, that the epilogue of the book was going to be, and then we had to go and just fight to keep the Affordable Care Act from being repealed, right? Um, but, so, like, on one level, I think, actually, the, like, not having a happy ending is not a bad thing, um, because that is how history works, and one of the things that I find myself always pushing back against uh, in teaching is the idea of, like, a progressive narrative. Mm -hmm. And even so, you can recognize that, like, yes, like, progress, progress is not um, automatic, progress is not inevitable, like, trying to fit up everything into a progress narrative um, is, you know, going to be intellectually dishonest. Um, but they're still, like, really satisfying, right? Like, a happy ending is, in some ways, like, a satisfying ending. Um, so how do you, like, do that narratively? Um, ask me in two years and maybe I'll know. Um, but no, it's, it's, like, really a problem that I have not figured out for the book, um, or in general. Uh, but, I mean, the, the story can have an unresolved ending and still be important, right? And... The, the epilogue for the book probably is going to be the fight to defend uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, but in a way that's, like, very particular to the story, because um, during the fight to protect the Affordable Care Act, um, I was able to go to Washington with some of the people that I've written about and, and do some of that work. So that kind of gives it a nice narrative ending, and I mean, in the story of Depending the Affordable Care Act is a success story. Yeah. Like, we did stop appeal. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, I don't know. So maybe it will have a, a kind of happy ending because that is ultimately, like, another story about the success of direct action. Like, that works because, I, I would argue, that works because of direct action because of people using some of the tactics that I talk about in the book going and sitting in and making their, you know, their, their physical vulnerability public um, so, in terms of, but in general, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, end, like, I ended so many lectures in the fall when I was teaching contemporary U.S. history, oh, like no. this. Or, like, the white nationalism lecture, just, like, like, it, it continues to suck. Like, it, <laughs> like, voter suppression goes on. <laughs> like, um, well, on that yeah. topic, <laughs> Another group has a group yeah. in like two minutes. So we have to see that, but thank you again so much, Dan, for being here. Thank you for having me.